Hey, this is Emrita from TechKick. Uh, sorry, it's been so long since I last spoke with you, uh, but it's been a crazy busy time with my work and uh, family and stuff like that. Uh, but I wanted to kick off this uh, new year with a couple of ideas on what I think is coming in the technology sector and what we're going to start seeing. Go oh, check it out. My, my hair is so long now uh, since we last spoke, since the last video you saw. Um, it's starting to go really fast. Um, but I'm really excited to be to be back and to have some free time again, hopefully to start uh, recording some of these things. Uh, a couple of things that I think uh, we started to see the trends of in 2011, but are really gonna explode and really you know, the results of our, some of the efforts are really gonna culminate in 2012 uh, include three or four things. Um, first one is that enterprise is gonna make a comeback. Enterprise software is gonna make a comeback. Uh, the second thing is that we're going to start seeing a uh, true globalization of startups and deal flow and venture capital and stuff like that. Uh, the third thing is that we're starting to see that the way people read, like the habit of reading, is changing um, and that it's not, it's not dead but it's changing. The fourth thing that we're going to talk about is education being disrupted. And the fifth and last but not the least thing that we're going to talk about um, is this whole notion of social and how social is changing. Um, so with that, let me kick it off. So the first thing is that enterprise software is going to be sexy again. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one of the first reasons is obviously that, you know, the last couple of years we've seen a huge rise of consumer technologies, consumer apps that are beautiful, intelligent, uh, smart, easy to use, you don't need training for it, uh, you know, user experience is important, uh, is an important aspect, and that has sort of prompted the users, like a typical user, to change their expectations of what they get out of their technologies at work. So imagine previously, two years ago, you had a guy who used to go to work and he had all this, like all these different tools and technologies that he would use, uh, you know, for the greater good of the company. Just, you know, the, I think the, the benefits of using those technologies outweighed the hassles in using those technologies. And so a lot of us used it, but then we would go home and we would have the Facebooks and the Instagrams and all sorts of, you know, Apple TV and AirPlay and all sorts of great stuff at home. And then we started to realize, like, why do I have to put up with this, you know, crappy enterprise software at work? Um, so our expectations in the last couple of years have changed as users of what we deserve and what we get out of tools that we use at work. Um, so enterprise software companies have obviously realized that and they're working hard to correct it. Um, you know, even at my own company at Price Metrics, where I work uh, full time, we realized that uh, a key method to get, you know, faster user adoption was to try to minimize as much training as possible and try to minimize as much hand-holding and babysitting and coaching as possible and try to make the product as user-friendly and easy to use and understand uh, as possible. And not that we didn't know that before, it's just that now there's a true focus on it and there's certain tried and tested mechanisms that, you know, hopefully the consumer app industry has brought to the enterprise software industry that we can leverage and use and make our own products better and hopefully our, our users um, users' lives uh, a bit more uh, easy. So that's that's prompted um, enterprise software companies to, you know, rethink and redevelop uh, those types of things. The second thing that's happened is that uh, enterprise software is now starting to see, or seems to be starting to concentrate on areas that might have been unexplored in the past. So there is a certain appetite for, for new things, new technologies in areas that we assumed that we didn't need any technology. For example, you know, human capital management, uh, uh, you know, performance management, like that's sort of, uh, in my mind, the topmost of some, some examples, specifically because I've seen SAP and Salesforce and all these guys uh, go after, you know, startups and companies that are doing this really, really well, and they're sort of taking that and putting it in the cloud and things like that. So there's a re- uh, focus on areas that were previously neglected. Uh, there's a lot of reform, you know, there's finance, financial reform, there's healthcare reform. So those types of regulations and reforms are prompting development and rethinking in those categories. Um, there's a lot of focus on uh, cloud, it's gotten really big. Um, and then there's obviously the changing nature of government and elections and how the powers and the people's hands and all those types of things. So we're rethinking a lot of big 
things, a lot of big concepts, big chunks of ideas. And uh, so we'll see, we'll start to see enterprise software really, uh, you know, re-energize that. That's going to be re-energized industry. Um, so enterprise software is going to be sexy again. It's, it's going to make a big comeback. And, you know, already we saw evidence of that in, in last year, but uh, it's really going to explode uh, in 2012. Uh, so that's my first um, takeaway for you. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the true globalization of startups and VCs and deal flow and you know how that stuff happens. Um, what that means is success will favor those startups or those companies that can build a local product for a global problem. So think Foursquare, think uh, Uber Cab, think uh, Groupon, uh, think Square. Uh, you know, all these startups are successful because they've tried to tackle a problem that was local in nature, but they have no, they know how to apply it to different economies and different markets. And those types of startups will start to see the most success. And we know the rate of startup failure, uh, it's, it's extremely high. But really, like now, you'll start to see that the ones that are successful, that have that longevity, are the ones that are able to take a local problem, a local concept, solve that, and apply it to different economies and different markets. Uh, so success is going to favor that. And plus, what's happening now is uh, the way you know you get the way we get monies for our startup ideas is changing too. You know, you could be a VC or an angel or whatever sitting in India and still invest in a startup in San Francisco. And so a lot of those boundaries and those walls are coming down. Governments are getting a bit more relaxed. Uh, startups are getting more comfortable accepting, you know, money and control from, uh, you know, VCs outside of their purview of their, you know, local or con uh, their, their basic, you know, in their, in their country profile. Um, and there's... Fortunately, I think a bit of a growing competition on trying to find startups that have the best talent, the best idea and stuff like that. So really the power hopefully is shifting to startups and there's going to be a true globalization because now you could be Sequoia Capital and you could still have like a VC in India that's fighting to fund a startup in Toronto. And that's amazing. I mean, that's that, that's that's sort of, that's what's happening. There's, there's starting to be, you know, there's no... Um, you know, like that's a different country. So there's a true globalization of deal flow and startups and how we invest in startups and uh, what kind of ideas will you solve, what kind of problems and can you solve the same problem in a different city and things like that. Uh, so that's really going to come to light in 2012, I think. Uh, the third thing I wanted to talk about, and I know I'd said I'll talk about social last, but I want to talk about it because it's pertinent to both the first points that I made. Um, what social meant to us in 2009, 2010, 2011 is going to be different in 2012. Social has already gone mainstream. I don't think that's a secret. I think a lot of companies, um, you know, young and old and, you know, small and large have realized the power of social. Uh, the sort of some of the, the power of the brand has you know, shifted from the actual brand into the, into, into the hands of the consumer, which is powerful. Like me as a consumer, I can complain about whatever, how Air Canada gave me the worst treatment and, you know, hopefully expect some kind of response. But that's not what, that's not what makes social media cool. What makes social media cool is that um, you can actually find information and answers a lot easier than we used to be able to. I mean, look at all the Q&A sites that are doing so well, like everything from Quora to... Toronto's own local uh, sprout up. Um, there's tons of Q and A sites that actually give you answers or opinions on those intangible uh, questions that you might have. Like, oh, okay, I'm moving from Toronto to San Francisco. I don't know anything about San Fran. I want to find a job and I want to find an apartment to live in and what have you and places to eat. Can someone give me some guidance? And now you can find answers to stuff like that without knowing anybody in San Francisco uh, and you know just not even some BS like you actually find answers that can help you and I think that's what uh, social is going to do for us in 2012. I think the focus is not going to be uh, so much to have friends and followers and likes and all that type of stuff. It's going to be on how can you help me and how can I help you. There's going to be social is going to shift into 
um, I guess, social collaboration. That's going to be the next big thing. Um, it's going to be one of those things where, you know, hopefully people will realize that they're not, they don't exist on this planet just to get followers, you know? Hopefully they exist on this planet to interact with people and followers and, you know, people that they follow uh, and be able to provide information and guidance and help uh, when needed so that uh, social collaboration combined with that pay it forward attitude is really going to come to light in 2012. Um, and, you know, every time I say 2012, I kind of think of that movie, the Doomsday movie, um, with John Cusack in it, and I don't think it's going to be, I don't think this year is going to be like that at all. I think it's, I think by the end of this year, we'll see a cultural shift in how we approach life and how we approach things. I think that's what's going to change, and I, you know, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. I think it's going to be the beginning of a new uh, renaissance, a new revolution almost, where suddenly our mind sh uh, there's, there's been a mind shift and we're, we're going to start thinking very differently. We're not going to um, think about, oh, what's, where's my next paycheck coming from? Where's, um, you know, what's my next job or career move? I think we're going to think about, oh, what's the next company I'm going to found? You know, what's, uh, how can I help my neighbors? How can I help this random person that I met on whatever online, you know, chat room uh, that, I don't know, wants to move to San Francisco, like whatever, you know, like I think it's going to, uh, it's going to be a pleasant surprise, I think, what's what's going to happen at the end of this year. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm just throwing that in there. It's not a prediction, it's a feeling. Um, <clears throat> the, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was reading. Reading is, you know, a lot of people say reading is dead, Oh my God! No, no, the kids read anymore, um, and I don't think that's the, that's the case at all. I think reading has gone up. Uh, I know with my busy lifestyle, I only get to read about you know properly, like only get to read about two or three books a year. I mean, I know that's probably low, um, but I read a lot of other stuff, and so start I started thinking like, okay, reading isn't dead. My my reading hasn't. Uh, slow down or anything it's just that I'm reading different things I don't pick up a novel anymore I don't pick up a book or a business book anymore I read blogs I read opinions I read magazines I read uh, blog posts by people or authors that I respect that I love that I learn from and then what I find is that the reading has shifted from you know that sort of you will read something in you know two days or three days or one week or whatever to like that bite-sized micro reading so I'm reading stuff over time and I'm learning over time and different people learn differently like I actually learn um, when if I read something and I can actually apply it in the next little while if I apply it I remember it and I, I totally um, learn from it I mean not talking about fantasy novels and stuff like that but um, you know, if you are reading something that's a bit tangible, that's uh, that's sort of maybe professional or business related, if you're able to apply it, uh, you learn from it. But the point I'm trying to make is reading hasn't changed. Reading has isn't dead. The way we read has changed. Uh, and the same goes for our kids. Like, um, I don't have kids, but I'm, you know, a lot of my friends have kids and I try to observe a, a, a lot of their habits. I have some of them on Facebook and stuff. And the way they interact and what they read and how they... Um, communicate about what they're reading to their friends is very different than how we used to do it in our generation. Uh, you know, I remember we used to buy books or borrow books from the library, and if I really liked something, I would recommend it to a friend, and that's kind of how our friends discovered, you know, what to read. So we were obviously influenced by each other and our teachers and whatnot, and that remains the case today, except it's online now. Um, and often I see people just saying, okay, you know, read the Steve Jobs biography, but skip pages one to whatever, 50, because that's all the stuff we know. And so the reading is accelerating. Um, so in 2012, I think, you know, there's already a few apps and companies and startups that uh, tackle reading in a different way and learning in a different way. And I think that's going to um, be very disruptive to what we're used to. Um, and that goes for education as well. You know, no more are people, even in my generation, learning by going to a class or signing up for a course. Like, you know, we go to like that, you know, two-day workshop or or we'll do like, a, you know, like I just discovered um, uh, uh, Skillshare, which, you know, I knew existed. I just never had the opportunity to, 
to check out. And now that I have, I, I love it. It's like uh, I can find people in my local area that want to teach a skill that I want to learn. You know, it's painting with acrylics on pottery. You know, where do I find a class on that? But there's a guy in his basement probably that knows how to do this and he's teaching the class and usually it's like whatever free or 10 bucks or whatever. And like, I think education is being disrupted, especially in, um, in uh, you know, areas of science and technology. Like uh, there's so many classes and workshops now on learning how to code, you know, mobile, uh, mobile friendly, WordPress, all that type of stuff. There's so many in Toronto already. And I'm sure that's the case uh, in many cities where you could just take a two day workshop and suddenly you have an introduction to programming and you don't have to sign up for uh, University of Toronto program and pay like, you know, $2,000, etc. So education, reading, all that stuff is being disrupted. There was already a trend starting in, you know, 2011. And now I think this year we'll really see a rise of that and we'll really see even parents react to things like that and say, hey, uh, I don't need to send my 15 year old daughter to whatever, you know, prep you know, co prep for college class because I'd rather send her or him to uh, a two or three day workshop and see what they like and what they gravitate to and what they're good at. And that's really going to be disruptive in the way we think about education, the way we think about reading and learning uh, and things like that. Um, so that's it. Those are my top three, you know, ideas and feelings and things that I think will really start to come to light and we'll see the culmination of their results and their efforts uh, this year. So I'm really excited. Um, I was talking with a friend the other day and I, and I said to them, I don't sometimes know why I'm not part of this type of, you know, revolution. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, runway to go. I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think there's a lot of different ways we can tackle these types of problems and I feel like I can contribute um, and I'm really excited actually uh, to see what's going to happen happen this year. So that's for me. Thanks and thanks for watching.